I'm honored to be here. I'm pleased to be here. Um, but I, I sort of had a, a, a sort of change of direction in thinking about this paper. Because when I first started drafting this plenary address, I had intended to talk sort of primarily about academic and professional matters. For example, I was going to dazzle you with the results of the Brown University Petra Archaeological Project and the success of intensive Mediterranean survey tactics in the landscapes of southern Jordan. And I was going to explore the success of the Levantine Ceramics Project and its capacity to bring some systematization, you know, sort of long-distance virtual systematization of our chronological and geographical understandings of pottery and how this might be accomplished in other parts of the Mediterranean. This I was cleverly going to use as a springboard into encouraging the correlation of different individual data sets, a, you know, sort of a side-by-side -side survey to build wider regional frameworks for understanding social and economic change through time. On the professional side, I was going to sound a note we have heard before about strengthening ties between the various societies of archaeology, not least in aid of lobbying efforts, for funding, for support, and I increasingly think just for basic comprehension in Washington, D.C. So my planned versions of this kind of stepping it up had been going to take forms such as these. But since my original kind invitation, quite a bit has happened in our neck of the world. And I'm sure I am not alone in this room in my observation that our cocktail party small talk has, uh, has changed. What do you do? I'm an archaeologist. And what you usually get back is, and we all know, this, oh, how fascinating, dinosaurs, <laughs> gold, you know, where do you dig? Uh, oh, my favorite is, I wanted to be an archaeologist until I grew up, I got a life, whatever. Now, I'm sorry to, you know, now, and I, I, this has happened to me repeatedly, now it's more like, oh, I'm so sorry. Your heart must be broken. What's going on must be so terrible for you. Or that especially gut-wrenching, you know, oh, that poor man in Palmyra. Now, ASOR, founded in 1900, is relatively early in its second century. And when it came time to articulate its, its vision for ASOR in the 21st century, it characterized itself in this way, the leading organization committed to the dissemination of knowledge and understanding of the Near Eastern world. And that is one hell of a heavy burden to bear. And ASOR has borne it extremely well in very difficult circumstances. The organization has worked tirelessly around the issue of heritage in peril. Uh, there's the Cultural Heritage Initiatives, whose goals, as you all know, are to document damage, promote global awareness, plan emergency and post-war responses. There's the Syrian Heritage Initiative uh, in conjunction with the State Department. And I give a big shout out to all involved. And this, of course, has worked in parallel and in cooperation with actions by UNESCO, by Blue Shield, by the Archaeological Institute of America. Uh, and I salute and I support all these efforts. So I salute this work, but I'm not going to talk much more about it tonight, in part because there are so many immensely better qualified people than me in this very room who could speak to this form of engagement. In part uh, because substantial time over the last several years now, substantial time at ASOR, at the AIAs, at other venues, has been spent on sessions, panels, workshops, all dedicated to heritage in conflict zones and what then can we do. 
uh, this very annual meeting. You can attend Friday afternoon session on satellite-based monitoring of cultural heritage and conflict situations that Scott Branting will be moderating. And then, of course, as it has been being buzzed up on the screen periodically already, the Cultural Heritage Initiative Symposium with Jesse Kasana as the keynote, and that's on Sunday. But I'm also not going to spotlight on it, in part because I believe there's critical space for ACOR, ACOR, it's bad too, ASOR activity and intervention outside and beyond, you know, this particular, however crucial issue. And I would argue that we would do well to cultivate that territory. So to put it somewhat provocatively, Uh, if heritage preservation, we ah, yeah, <laughs> well worth waiting for, right? Now, to put it somewhat provocatively, if heritage preservation is our first and at least perceived to be our only focus, we run the risk of giving primacy and priority to monuments and objects rather than to our study of the past societies that created them over time deployed them, and in many cases, in their own time, destroyed them. And it deflects, I would argue, energy and attention from our role as teachers, as translators, to the present societies, you know, who otherwise will never learn of them. So my question, I guess, is can we be, do we only want to be, about the archaeology of loss? Now, with this, the invitation to de deliver this plenary uh, came what I thought was a terrific suggestion uh, to think about ASOR 2050, a visionary look at where ASOR and the issues that the organization would be invested in, where would we be by the middle of the 21st century? And that's kind of, you know, when you sort of say, well, that's Looking forward, looking backward, it's not that far away. But, you know, change is dizzying in ASOR's history. This is a map of uh, our neck of the woods. ASOR, aged 14. ASOR, ASOR at 111. Um, and, you know, so ASOR 2050 from now. We cannot tell. Beep. There. See? We cannot tell. <laughs> so we cannot tell what the geopolitics of the region will be. We can make a, you know, a guess at what the climatic and environmental conditions will be. We cannot tell what will remain of particular sites or museums. We cannot tell if and where we might be able to do field work, who will fund it, who our partners might be. And that blankness could become the bounds of our reality. Now, such a course, of course, would not be wise. Uh, so what I'd like to do in the rest of this uh, discussion is to review some possibilities of things we can control and things we can do between right now and 2050. Now, some of these I know are being done already. Some, I imagine, are being done, and I'm just ignorant of who and where. Uh, and some are opportunities that I've only myself recently become exposed to, and like, like most converts, fresh converts, want to be annoying and to share. So I'm hoping uh, that there can be some crowdsourcing of ideas and that those more expert than I will also comment and weigh in, either in this venue or at our many parties. Now, in what I say here, I must emphasize, I, I don't mean to sound uh, either preachy or naive, uh, but I do think we have to sort of start at a very basic point. There are some formidable factors collating around us. The state of higher and lower education in North America, the declining perception uh, and respect for the academy, uh, the geopolitics of the Middle East, oil, radicalism, Islamophobia, climate change, and regional instability. So looking forward, 
uh, is scary and should be scary. Not desperate, but, but scary and full of urgency. So where then should our energy go? Uh, the cobbler to his last education, education, education. And what I find is this is usually when the energy just goes out of the room. It's like, <laughs> education, you know, that old thing, you know, we, been, we do that all the time. Sometimes I, you know, I really wonder why we are so often uh, defensive or dismissive about, you know, our, our core role in society. It's something, it's something to ponder. Now, what might help in recalibrating uh, what gets included or what, what, when we say education, what we mean, uh, we, should, we could recalibrate around audience, methodology, content, delivery, and that's where I want to sort of uh, take on this metaphor of, of stepping, of stepping, stepping up. Uh, think about change. You see, you know, the, uh, I, managed, I put the blackboard with the chalk right over the guy looking at Facebook in the lecture just, you know, to keep us, keep us cheerful. Uh, but we all, we all know what's really going on back there. So think about stepping up, uh, changing things. And think about what we can do, for example, across a spectrum of time as uh, people climb the ladder of life. Now, as college professors, as many, I know not all of us are, but many of us are, our constituency is that glorious window of time, you know, the 18 to 21-ish year olds. Uh, anyone know which college this is? Indiana Jones, exactly, yes, Marshall College. Marshall University, sorry. Now, what is increasingly clear uh, outside perhaps certain, you know, Research One universities is that kids are not coming in well prepared and they are ignorant of much, you know, sort of formally accepted background knowledge. Now, I know that this seems to have been the case forever, but it is markedly getting worse. And that especially holds if you get into other domains of higher education, uh, community colleges, regional colleges, metropolitan colleges, which incidentally, I feel it is incumbent upon us to do. So where do we begin? As early as possible is clearly the answer. And we're talking K-12, kindergarten right through high school. Uh, we've all done the go in and talk about what you do, the show and tell. How many people have done that? You go in, yeah, yeah, oh, God bless us all, yeah. Here's my auntie, she does, she likes dirt, you know. The dog and the pony show, and you know, and good, good for us. But we all know, you know, the impact is limited, and in terms of the energy and the time, it's not, it's just not cost effective. It's not doable to scale. So what are some of our options in this particular domain, that one step up, as it were, in educating? Uh, outreach to schools in a more organized, distributed fashion. At Brown, the Joukowsky Institute is running a, a program called Think Like an Archaeologist. There's some veterans sitting right down here. We go into sixth grade classrooms. Uh, how many people are involved in that kind of, that kind of thing? Organized? Organ Good for you, organized outreach. Two, explore opportunities to uh, inform and sort of create curriculum, elements that can be imported into a curriculum, readings or uh, core, you know, lecture outlines, things like that. Now, how you do this will vary from place to place, but it's amazing what needs to be done. A friend of mine was invited to revise a sort of a big history, and by God, we must be in those big history classes. A big history course for middle schoolers in Michigan, and he, it took him about a week to get over the realization that uh, when it came to Near Eastern civilizations, uh, Wittfogel was still the man. Number three, digital material. You know, for better or for worse, this is how kids are learning and where they are comfortable. Now they're are resources out there already, and 
I would also say that promulgating uh, you know, good examples is just as valuable as making new ones. I think uh, there's a, a ton out there. It's more, in some cases, it's more a matter of corralling and informing people than starting all over again from scratch. Uh, I'm, uh, this is an example here. This is a, another, so, you know, I, you can have embarrassing pictures of your own graduate students. So this is Alex Smith uh, doing a, a think like an archaeologist in Rochester, but he has gone on. He's won an award from the AIA as Alex the archaeologist and has done some, uh, created a couple e-books which uh, are, you know, free downloadable on Egypt and on Greece. Uh, I personally, is Emily here? No? Oh, too bad. Uh, another student is t would love to design a ga you know, gamification of, of, uh, of our subject, and that's another angle to play. And finally, teaching the teachers, uh, in person or online. A great deal of online content is consumed by teachers who want to know more, who want to do better. So I think that's a hunger that we can cater to. Now, all of this, of course, is not our usual domain, and, it, and I'm not saying it is easy. It's especially tricky in the public school system and will get trickier. Uh, teaching to the common core you know, restricts um, certain degrees of pedagogic ingenuity. Uh, testing curtails space for innovation. You've all heard these arguments and discussions. And the trend, obviously, of course, is continually towards more emphasis on English, math, the STEM fields, and less and less time for social science. We can fight that, of course, but I would also in, instead point to experiments with wedging archaeology and ancient history into the system. Uh, having you know them hit those right common core criteria, and indeed Alex's ebook uh, on Egypt and Greece and his the presentations he gives to school groups does indeed you, know, you could read it there it it counts for the common core it ha it shares that space. I have a pet dream of uh, developing ways to use archaeology as a STEM teaching, a sort of a launch pad for STEM, and if anyone wants to talk about that, I will buy them a drink. Uh, I, so I was extra delighted with a 20% discount. <laughs> so. Now, you may well feel, and I understand this, that you know, this kind of thing is, is not only out of our domain, but it's really not our department. And I'm certainly not advocating that we all give up what we do and go leap into the trenches of K-12. But I would argue that we have to start thinking about education as more of a life process, and thus, and thus about how to start developing, you know, from the first step onward, developing an awareness, developing an interest. Now, for colleges, we know what we do, but do we know where we do it? Do we have a good sense? of where ancient Near Eastern studies, Near Eastern archaeology, any idea where these things are taught? If you type uh, ancient Near, you know, literally that question, where is Near Eastern archaeology taught in the United States? This is one of the first things that pops up. Uh, this is a, a very nice account of just how wonderful it was in San Diego last year at ASOR, where I, there were apparently no tornadoes. And, uh, you know, but, okay, so the, posted by a, a, a colleague from Tel Aviv University. Um, that's not helping me figure out uh, where these courses are taught or where they are not taught or where they, you know, the stuff may be there, but in some part of a larger big history type course, or where they are not. And if we don't know, I think we should find out. And if the results, uh, again, thinking across the broader spectrum of higher education, uh, not just the liberal arts colleges, not just the R1s, but if the results of that survey are as I suspect they will be, uh, we're going to have to be strategic. It is unlikely in the extreme that there will be an uptick of jobs 
in our specific field anytime soon. I posed another question. There we go. Uh, you know, where, you know, uh, jobs in Near Eastern Studies query. And, and, and this is what, I, I kid you not, this is what you get. Uh, yeah, pyramids were number one. Uh, yep. You know, clearly uh, 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 making nice nice with your professor was number two, and and I have no idea what the what the what the cat is. Doing. <laughs> you know, so again, not not you know, it's not the most helpful. So I, we're gonna have to be we're gonna have to be wily. We're gonna ha you know we're gonna have to be strategic. Uh, for example, we must ensure that we develop and train our students so that they're versatile and that they can hit those more generalist uh, jobs, those generalist spots. Another scalable strategy, again, is this sharing of digital content. Uh, take good teachers um, who are teaching solid courses well, people in this room, and capture their presentations uh, digitally, do it professionally, do it inventively, uh, lecture capture is fine, but there are other ways to go. Uh, I think Berkeley has a whole lecture capture series. I'm sure many other places do as well. Um, the bottom line is, though, make them so open access. Make them uh, available for people, everyone, to check out. Rather as if you, know, you would check out a library book or an article you want the kids to read. Get them the stuff up front, done by someone else, and then flip your classroom. Flip it, blend it, what, hybrid it, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, in other words, get that information transfer. You know, that's, I'm sorry to say, we are the big blue meanie in, in this diagram. But instead of you imparting, let them watch it, and then do something, you know, discuss, collaborate, workshop, whatever. Uh, chew on it in a different way. Late, you know, after they have the data. Now that's if we are teaching it. Uh, I would argue a step further and say if the goal here is to cover geographic and economic gaps in curricula and teacher capacity, you know, then the instructor we are aiming for might be someone who doesn't know much at all but either has to or wants to get that element of Near Eastern history and archaeology into his teaching mix. So let's not make it harder for them. Give them something to work with, give them stuff to share, to show, uh, basically, you know, think outside our individual or our department or even our college or university sphere. Now this kind of behavior is alien to business as usual, we all know, and it is a, it is, it's going to be a struggle, it's going to be a culture shift. Uh, I have a friend who once said the teacher, and she was not happy about this, I said, we as teachers are the only ones who have to write our own script, perform our own play, and then ultimately get the bad reviews. Uh, the upside is you get to control the classroom. You know, you are up here. No question, flipping, blending, borrowing, becoming, you know, the same size as your students just about in the diagram, that's, uh, that's jarring, and it is a culture shock. But I would say that the early very common fear that, you know, going online, digital content, uh, would devastate the job market, and especially in the humanities, that does not appear to be playing out. That seems to be uh, a receding concern. Instead, I think this kind of, you know, put it out there, share, uh, teach across and with other people's material, uh, this is a way that we can be present in the curriculum, present in people's thinking, where otherwise we will be invisible and we will be ignorable. Now, of course, the, uh, you know, the liberal arts colleges and the research ones are, are again, not so much of a worry here, uh, maybe. That's another thing we might want to kick the tires on. 
But there are over 2,500 2, accredited four-year institutions of higher learning. There's over uh, 1,500 community colleges out there nationwide. Uh, this is a map, actually. This is the best proxy, apparently, for finding out where students are. This is uh, where they, you know, people buy typical student stuff, uh, which apparently is a combination of certain kinds of bedding and bongs or something like that. You know, so it's a it's sort of so you know, it's 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 a it's a it's impressionistic, but it's. You know, again, it was the you know the, the you know the, the best the best I, the best I could find. So you know, it's it's a, there's a lot of places out there teaching, and I think it's also good to bear in mind that the model of the so-called traditional college experience, you know, residential four years sort of maybe plus or minus a little bit four years to graduation, you know, that that actually uh, you know that traditional student. Uh, makes up less than 30% of all American students in higher education today. Uh, the much more common are kids who intermit, they stop, they make money, uh, they drop out, they come back, they move, and so on. So I think if we want to stay on people's radar and not just the whatever percent we think we are reaching, then I think we have to get more nimble. Because at present, we are seeding these people without much of a fight. Let me give you, you know, a couple more sort of specific uh, targeted ways to proceed. Um, one model is something that's going on at, uh, at Michigan. This is the, uh, something called Digital Islamic Studies. I don't know if anyone else is involved in this initiative. It's uh, Michigan and the, uh, the Midwestern Consortium, the CIC. Uh, basically, the, you know, God bless the Mellon Foundation, they awarded a grant to, cr to do exactly that kind of sharing of content, to create courses that could be shared across that consortium of Midwestern universities. Uh, and, well, you can read it for yourself. One problem with m moving into this world is, is having to uh, read Ed speak. Uh, leveraging the existing synchronous learning infrastructure and long-standing area studies capacities of the CIC, this consortium aggregates courses and expertise currently scattered among the member schools, thereby making it possible to provide a broader Islamic studies curriculum than any one campus can offer. Now, that's great. Why they have to say it quite like that, I do not know. Uh, but what's going on? You know, it's just starting over five years. They want to sort of, you know create and corral uh, about a dozen undergraduate courses, and they're looking at religious studies, history, art history, complet, anthropology, poli-sci, why not archaeology? Second, I think we can take on edgier issues. Uh, this isn't all about just trying to get some basic facts out there. For example, uh, digital learning experiences such as, such as MOOCs that Susan referred to, uh, they have a global reach. Uh, the Coursera platform claims students in every country on Earth. Uh, apparently someone in North Korea somehow managed to sign up and do a class. So it's you know, every single country. But the question has been raised, are they always global in perspective? So this edX MOOC, Visualizing Japan, basically brought that, to, you know, took that problem on head on uh, and looked at the period around the arrival of Commodore Perry, uh, Pacific Overture's fame, uh, and the Americans, and that of the Japanese in, at exactly the same time crunch. And you see here, visualizing Japan with a combination of MIT, Harvard, and University of Tokyo. Um, apparently this has been astonishingly provocative. And I would ask, why can't we do that with the Crusades? Now that makes a good bridge to our next step up, and that's lifelong learning. I did, as Susan mentioned, I taught a MOOC at Brown, uh, and if it wasn't quite a road to Damascus moment, uh, archaeology's dirty little secrets was, was just a revelation. 
of how many people out there around the world like what we do and very, very much want to know more. Now, it's not the bazillions that sign up to learn Python, whatever that is, or, you know, financial analysis to be rich, or, you know, not, not in that league, but it's a substantial body, and it's a, a sort of a, an audience of learners. Whoop, there we go. Um, you know, people, you, that's a pie chart of who these kind of people are, unemployed, employed, retired, uh, uh, some are housebound, you know, a, a very broad spectrum of people, uh, people with interest, with time, with energy, and, yes, with money. They have all that to engage with us. And just to underline the global, uh, the global aspect of it, the map below, the second iteration where we found our students. Now, I'd be happy to, you know, talk more about my MOOC, and we have, uh, we have, uh, I won't call you out by name, but I have one of my principal uh, partners in crime sitting up front here. Um, I will say that a favorite exercise of the uh, archaeology's dirty little secrets was write like an Acadian. Uh, this was, uh, there was sort of filmed content of uh, to graduate students talking about, you know, the script and what it is and then showing them how they, is Willis here? Hi, Willis. Yeah, Willis over there uh, uh, did this and created this onslaught of how you can write Akkadian in crazy ways. That's a beware of the dog uh, Akkadian tablet. We had uh, Akkadian uh, cupcakes. We had cakes. We had the whole nine yards. I, on the right-hand side there, that's just, a, a, just a, uh, another example of the kinds of things you can do. That's uh, Willis's translation of a rock song uh, by a group apparently called the Dirty Projectors. So, you know, getting outside our space of comfort. Now, there are an increasing number of archaeology-related uh, MOOCs out there. There's mine. Uh, there's uh, Nubia by Peter Lacavara, who I think is going to be, be here at the meetings from Emory. Uh, there's a new one being launched from the University of Liverpool uh, on Egyptology uh, uh, and, you know, He's got a great dishy British accent, so I, you know, you know, basically someone's got to do a MOOC about pyramids and it will go viral, you know, so it's my advice to you. Now, the efficient thing about MOOCs is that once made, they can be reused, and second, you know, they are modular, so you can, the constituent pieces can be deployed in different fashion. Uh, we've had requests by library groups, Interest clubs, the Lions, uh, senior citizens groups, and in current demographics, smart and able seniors must be acknowledged as a growing resource base. Now, to those of us of a certain age, it seems ironic, but such uh, these digital classes or digital events uh, genuinely can build community. Uh, Facebook, Facebook, Twitter continue to connect to that Dirty Little Secrets class. Uh, they talk to each other. They talk to us. They can be reached, and they can be mobilized. We can get them reading. We can get, you know, tell them about museum events. We can get them writing letters to their congressmen. We can get them working with things like crowdsourcing. Uh, there is this, of course, the University of Pennsylvania's Ur crowdsource. Uh, there's a new, really uh, remarkable uh, British consortium, uh, Micropasts, a British museum, and a couple other folks. And they're working around the concept of citizen archaeologists. So I think we are not only missing an audience, uh, we're missing potential and much needed allies. Now we've all heard about lifelong learning before uh, and it's, you know, it is something that it's easy enough to pay lip service to, but it is clear that, no, sorry, try one more. There we go. Here's my, here's my stepping, my stepping metaphor. Uh, and you know, you can pay lip service to it. I mean, who's against lifelong learning? Certainly not us. 
But I think we have to take it more seriously than perhaps hitherto. It's clear that models of education are shifting and rapidly shifting. Millennials are going to bat through several jobs in their peak years. They're going to need continual re-education. They're going to need retooling in new skills, and that's part of what's feeding the MOOC phenomenon. So any idea that school is something that you, you, you suffer through and then you never do again, uh, you know, that's going to be deeply alien to that generation, and it's even now increasingly undesirable to older folks already. So if we want to get and stay on people's radar, uh, then we're going to have to get more nimble. So we have, you know, and that sounds simple enough, a staircase that looks like that can suddenly become something that looks like this because, uh, you know, it may seem simple enough to move people up and along, uh, you know, to provide and share age-appropriate, skill-appropriate resources to see everyone as potential learners, uh, but as we all know, potential learners will all possess different sweet spots and they will react variably to particular modes of teaching. Uh, just looking at, you know, veterans, for example, I'm sure many of you are aware of Operation Nightingale. How many people have heard of Operation Nightingale? Oh, okay. Uh, Operation Nightingale is not an Escher staircase. Whee, there we go. It's a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a program in the United Kingdom. Uh, and basically what it does, and actually there's a fledgling parallel in the U.S. What it does is it offers an immersive experience, you know, in a field project for physically or mentally wounded veterans. Uh, you know, uh, picking up on the, we like to pretend, but the undoubted overlap of many archaeological and military skills and aptitudes. So basically they take these, the, uh, these veterans at risk and they embed them in archaeological projects and create some, a supportive community. Uh, it's a still evolving and certainly by no means straightforward idea. Uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is springboarding off archaeology as well. They're using curation uh, needs, curation opportunities, as a means to train veterans in transferable uh, skills, uh, job skills, computer databases, photography, scanning, software programs, and so on. Now, none of this is specific to Near Eastern archaeology, but given where many of these veterans are coming from, uh, such work bears attention, assessment, and consideration, I would say, by this community. There is also the possibility of educating through public commentary and perhaps even satire. Uh, ben Carson and his pyramids. I give a shout out to those archaeologists who landed on his case, uh, Christina Kilgrove, uh, Jody Magnus, I'm sure there are many other people. But I do wonder if we missed a larger collective, really big opportunity to uh, blow an enormous raspberry uh, at him, or better, or just to stake a claim to the knowledge we produce. Um, to demonstrate, as I'm sorry to say, as a non-archaeologist put it, to demonstrate that statements such as this make us laugh our asses off. Now, it's no secret, I mean, this, with this, that, you know, higher education, especially in its higher echelons, in the United States today is much demonized, castigated as expensive, useless, selfish, irrelevant, we need more welders than philosophers, and so on. Now, the heavy burden ASOR bears, however, the fact that its core geographical zone is, you know, notoriously in the news, painfully in the news, that can be taken as an opportunity to be vocal. Now, we do this, of course, around the issue of uh, heritage and peril, destruction of monuments, but what else could we talk about? Uh, Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders was uh, mocked 
for his assertion that climate change, water shortages, drought have and will contribute to instability in the Middle East. Aren't climatic vicissitudes and societal uh, adaptation to such vicissitudes, isn't that something we do talk about? We can, we are talking about. Uh, aren't site-specific, well-adapted systems of water management something we do talk about, we are talking about, we can talk about, and you see here uh, Bert DeVries' wonderful work at Umel Jamal. Um, can we teach around the issue of resiliency in the long durée? Now, I would say yes to all of that and more, and I was extremely pleased to see a session on archaeologists engaging global challenges and that's coming on Saturday afternoon. Now, there are many reasons, of course, why we don't uh, occasionally or routinely uh, do these kinds of things. Uh, my impression, however, is that many of us would like to experiment in these and other areas, uh, these new spaces, and sometimes we do, and sometimes it costs us. And that means that we have to force or require Another culture shift, if moving away from being the sage on the stage, the independent teacher, if that's going to be one shock, another is the need to redefine the place of public engagement in the value system of the American Academy. Uh, this is a touchy subject, of course, especially for the young. Uh, one, we've all heard it, you can hear uh, mouth talk about what types of contributions will be recognized when it comes to tenure and promotion time. Uh, you know, what, what if you do a MOOC and flip it? What if you write an op-ed? What if you run a community field school? They'll tell you it counts, but it remains a hell of a risk at most institutions. That said, there is increasing pressure being brought, you know, across a spectrum of fields to revise the boundaries between scholarship and service as there has long been you know, increasing melding and mixing around the gaps, supposedly, between research and teaching. I would not ask the young to wage this campaign, which is really too bad because you would be the best ones at it. Uh, but the more established, the old among us, and we know who we are, might want to step back and think about how, you know, across the course of our careers, how our jobs can slide in and out of different modalities, how we can make time for this kind of thing. All right, to conclude, we live in a terrible time. Uh, let's return to our cocktail party. Yeah, it's a terrible time. Have a drink. Uh, all right. What do you do? I'm an archaeologist. How horrible for you. Is there going to be anything left? That poor old man at Palmyra. I think we can use this painful awareness. We can solicit defense and documentation of the monuments, the looting. We can advocate for teaching about the region and its people. We can refuse to let the pre-modern Near East go down as some sort of weird, immaterial precursor to an endlessly troublesome part of the world. And we can oppose those who wish its inhabitants to be stereotyped and essentialized. As with the fight against ISIS, et cetera, this will be a fight on multiple fronts and multiple scales, and no doubt with multiple instances of success and failure. But I think our ultimate goal should be this, that when people ask, what do you do? And I say, I'm an archaeologist. They don't then say, oh, this is terrible for you. They will say, this is terrible for us for all of us. Thank you very much. <laughs>